19. Last week, I mentioned that uh, the subject of eunuchs, I don't know, it's just not something I spend a lot of time studying. Uh, before that, Matthew chapter 18 and confrontation, dealing with your, your brother and the Lord. Uh, you know, um, I don't go out of my way to teach about money. I'm sorry, I, I don't do that. You know, some churches do that all the time. The, the people who are financial experts, they often have a kind of a nice twang in their voice. And they, you know, they, they're like, that's all the Bible's about. And they all always talk about money and things like that. And we talk about money when it comes up in the scriptures. And so today, Matthew chapter 19, a rich young ruler is going to come to Jesus and he's going to just speak these big boastful words. Uh, you know, what must I do to... Uh, inherit eternal life, and, and as the traveling 12 would be walking along in this event, they'd, they'd be looking at him going, Jesus, don't send him away. He's rich. We need money. He's young. He's energetic. He's a ruler. He has influence. It's kind of like the world today. You know, if some Christian or some, some entertainer suddenly gets saved, Christendom is like, we've got to get that guy a platform. I realize he's a babe in Christ, and I realize that the scriptures say not to give a platform to someone who's not prepared because he'll be taken in a snare of the devil, but we just need to give that person a great big platform and uh, watch them get torn up by the wolves out there, and because they're rich, because they're young, because they're a ruler, they have influence over people, we give them a platform, especially if it's in our church. We're going to get a lot of people through the door, and by the way, we pass the plate every Sunday. Now, if you've ever noticed here, uh, the only time we've ever asked for money is when someone outside of the church was in need. Uh, the family uh, of the young man uh, a year and some change ago who successfully took his own life, uh, we raised money for them. That was a great blessing, and they were very, very blessed by that, and they became receptive to the gospel um, because of that, and that's, that's wonderful. Um, it's pretty rare when we ask for money. We don't pass a plate. I believe that God's people will be moved by God to put enough money in the plate. You know, pastors are called to live by faith as well as everyone else. And uh, God, he provides. He's good. Sometimes he'll rake us through the emotional coals of wondering where money's going to come from. And I have to say, I think today in the way the world has been evolving and the end times are uh, e e unrolling before us, that this is just a great subject to talk about. Finances. You know, I don't drive my pickup truck because <laughs> it's diesel. And even though I love the whir of the turbo and, and all of that, I believe it's actually greener in the long run than an electric car because it is the fuel refinery right there. And uh, Anyways, if you need to move something heavy or big, you're not going to do it with a Prius. It's just not going to work out and things like that. So we're living at a time when, you know, the prognosticators about finances, I, I don't like to listen to them. You know, it's just, it's like annoying. It's like, oh, yeah, everything's going to get more expensive. And, and there's the fear that's put on us. One of the things that the news wants to do, whether it's liberal or conservative, they're all part of the same bandwagon unless it's a Christian news source who is intentionally trying to bring light, uh, the, the news in the light of the gospel on, into our life, both, all of the news sources, remember, Satan is the prince of the power of the airwaves. I added the word waves there. But yeah, he's, he's coming at you 24-7, and one of the things he wants to do is bring about stress and unbelief and, and, and anxiety in people because if a nation, if a people, if a family, if a congregation, if they're torn because of political views, they will not stand. Well, we are standing in a day when the news is saying, watch out for inflation. It's going to be huge. It's going to be unbearable. And that's fantastic because we look at the rest of the world at the time it is, and it's fantastic in the sense that Americans have been living so fat on the hog for so long, it is, it is difficult for us to live by faith. I need that verse. I dropped one. It stuck to my finger. It's difficult for us to live by faith when our bank account's full, right? I don't need faith. I've got my 401k, you know, just kind of tongue-in-cheek there. But we live this life, and we live with so much pleasure in our, in our plans, and, and it's so frequent 
that we just aren't living a life of gospel giving, right? And I'm not a social justice person at all, but there is a lot of social injustice out there. And unfortunately, as you guys know, the uber wealthy, the billionaires, during the COVID lockdown, I forget how many, every 31 days, every 33 days, there was a new billionaire that happened during that. While prices are going up and inflation is happening and this what appeared to be a pre-planned event in so many ways, those who had a heads up on it, their investments grew, even under the name of philanthropy, and other people suffered. And there's so much suffering going on today, and the billionaires, it would appear, they don't care because they hop in their private jet and they fly to Davos, France, and they talk about how to make more money under the guise of, we're fixing the planet, right? And so... They are the ones that they could just open up their wallet and they could just take care of so many things. But they really don't care. They're being led astray by finances and the the desires of money. And I want to make sure that the church isn't, right? Money is not your savior. Jesus is. And so we have to turn our eyes and look to the Lord and say, God, what is my part, especially in these last days, what is my part with money? How am I hoarding? What if, what if the rapture happened today? How much of your money would be left behind? Well, all of it. Um, so what would, you're going to go like, oh, I was, I was saving that to give to or to do. And the Lord will say, there's a whole bunch of eternal rewards sitting down there in your mattress that you're hiding away for a rainy day. And I'm not using the rainy day clause. If you're a tele-evangelist, you say, you know, it's, it's a rainy day. I know you've been putting that $50 away, ma'am, and that mattress or hiding it in the cookie jar or it's in the picture frame of your family. It's in the back there, that $100 bill tucked away in the envelope. And they go through all the scenarios and then they say, today's that rainy day for my ministry. Yeah. <laughs> and I always just go, oh my goodness, why are people so gullible? Jesus is going to tell a rich young ruler, if I get to the scriptures, He's going to tell a rich young ruler to sell it all. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm telling you to put your ear to the heartbeat of the Lord, to be humble, to be listening to the Holy Spirit, to be in prayer and asking him, Lord, I have wealth in this area. I have these assets. What would you have me to do with them? Because if he's going to come for us by the end of the year, the end of the week, the end of the sermon... The end of the sentence, all the rest of it's left behind. And then you know the Antichrist is going to take it over. And that's just going to, you know, it's like, oh, or flashbang. We'll call him that if you follow certain people on, on the internet. Flashbang will get it all in his account. And then we'll be like, oh, I can't believe that guy ended up with my money. Anyways, it's not your money. It's the Lord's. Let's jump into the scriptures. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. And behold... One came and said to him, good teachers, good teacher, excuse me, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Now, everyone says of his own self that they are good. And this young man, uh, the scriptures tell us that he's rich and he's young and he's a ruler and uh, from the other accounts. And he comes to Jesus and he's like, what must I do to be saved? And, And I think it's Luke's account. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life. So he's using very humble language, and he's speaking to, uh, the, uh, to Jesus. And, you know, like I say, to the, the 12 traveling, they'd be like, hey, don't push him away, Jesus. We want this guy on our team. He's, he's got the finances, he's got the energy, and he's got the influence. He's going to make a great poster child for your evangelistic crusade here. And Jesus Jesus looked at him, Mark says, and loved him at the end of the account. Jesus looked at him and loved him, okay? So Jesus loves this person. And so love says the gospel, the salvation of the soul precedes everything else, right? That's where humanistic Christianity fails so badly. I want to give them a sandwich. I want to give them some Tom's shoes. I want to make sure that they're happy and comfortable as they go to hell. That's not love at all. And so Jesus looks at him, he loves him. Jesus asks the question of him, 
Why do you call me good? Oh, excuse me. I'm thinking from another place. Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. So we'll just kind of a little bit of uh, in the weeds here, just a little bit. Uh, some translations do not have where Jesus says, why do you call me good? I think it probably belongs here. It makes the context well, for my understanding anyways. Why do you call me good? There's none good but one, that is God. And some would say the, the opponent of the scriptures, they go, see, Jesus says he's not good, only God is good. Isn't that goofy? I, I read that right there in Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus, okay, because he's good. And Jesus, his father, says from heaven at the baptism of Jesus, this is my beloved son who I'm well pleased, right? So what's that say about Jesus? The Father says he's good. The Holy Spirit says he is good. Jesus here is now testifying that he is not only good, but he is God, okay? He has the testimony of his Father that he is, he is good, and the Father is well pleased. And so Jesus says, why do you call me good? There is no one good but God. So he's identifying to, to those who are watching that this person is calling him good and that the good answer, every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of Above, right, James tells us. And so Jesus is the good one. And this man is saying, hey, good teacher, I'm pretty good too. What must I do to have eternal life? And he, he said to him, of course, keep the commandments. So there you go. Exodus chapter 20 is probably uh, the most common place to think of the Ten Commandments. We have the two tablets of the law. Moses, of course, came down. God said, Moses, come up, and I'm going to give you the rules to live by. And Moses is given the Ten Commandments. First time Moses, no, God chiseled him with his finger. Moses comes down. He sees they're breaking all Ten Commandments. He throws them down there. Mel Brooks, in his movie, he said, right, when, when he comes down, he goes, behold, the 20. And he drops one. <laughs> or the 15. <laughs> the Ten Commandments, right? This is the fullness of the law. The Old Testament gives us multiple testimonies of the Ten Commandments. There are slight changes and variations, but those are after they went into the promised land. The Ten Commandments that are given in Exodus chapter 20 are given while they're still in the midst of the Gentiles. Okay, so it's the law given to the Jews, but it's given outside of the promised land. So it's not the ceremonial law. It is the moral law because it doesn't say in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 the only one of the Ten Commandments, or the only one of the Old Testament commandments I, I probably haven't broken, thou shalt not boil a kid in its mother's milk. I've never even done that in my heart. That's the only, the only boasting I have right there. Um, I have had uh, meat with milk before, so I know. Good thing the blood of Jesus <laughs> cleanses me of all my sins. So anyways, Exodus chapter 20 is the law of the Lord, which is perfect, which converts the soul, the Psalms tell us. And so Jesus says to him, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. So this man being a rich young ruler, he's educated and he's a ruler. He may have been part of the Sanhedrin. And he says, which ones? You were just talking about marriage and divorce in the previous chapter, Gamaliel or Halal. Was it, is it a rabbi's commandment or is it a commandment from the Torah? And so Jesus he turns to the Torah, and he, he gives him the tablet of the law that was relating to human relationships. And he's using the law lawfully, as Paul says in 1 Timothy, and he is using it to open up his eyes of understanding. So Jesus says, said to him, he said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, right? We're all good on that one. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So this is great. Of the tablets of the law, the two tablets, and this is just a great way of looking at it. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, I'm the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other God before me. He's, God starts off with just the basic understanding that he is the most important. He is the only one. That's the first commandment. Then he goes through not to take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. He uh, says not to uh, profane the Sabbath day. And 
then he goes into the commandments of men, right? Do not murder. Murder not is what it says in the Hebrew. Murder not. That's, that's good. And then commit adultery. Not. Steal. Not. Honor your father and mother. Do not covet is added in there. But he, Jesus, leaves those out. And then he jumps to Leviticus 19. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we all know we can't just walk past some of these commandments and, and leave them at where Jesus leaves them. Here, the Old Testament reckoning of the commandments was given to awaken the heart, and then the relationship should have saved the soul. But they instead, the Jews at that time, had turned to religion. We talked about last week, religion believes that God can't see you. He doesn't know your thoughts. He doesn't know your inward feelings and fears. But this relationship with the eternal and personal God, he knows your thoughts, right? So that's where Jesus comes on the scene in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, if you are angry with your brother without cause, remember, you got to have a cause, and it's okay to be angry if you have a cause. Some translations take out the without cause. It's the without cause clause. Anyways, if you're angry without a cause, then you are in danger of judgment, right? If, if you are saying, thou fool, or you worthless person, then you're the one who should stand before the council. So Jesus takes... The words, instead of saying just murdering someone, putting a knife in their heart, he's saying if you've murdered their, if you had character assassination, if you have murdered them in your heart, and then J John, excuse me, yeah, John clarifies that farther. He says if you hate your brother, then you're a murderer in your heart, and you have no eternal life abiding in you. So the fullness of scriptures brings that out. So what is written in the Old Testament is to be applied deeply in our hearts. Jesus will say, not only to not commit adultery, but if you've looked with lust, you've already done that in your heart. So the heart is what matters because of, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so Jesus uses these now, and, and he uses those commandments, and it's really great. But he ends with, remember, if you want someone to remember something, the thing you want them to remember, you say, last. So Leviticus 19, he quotes and says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, <laughs> you have no idea who you're talking to, Jesus. I'm the rich young ruler. I have kept all from my youth. Now, in his opinion, he had, and Jesus will pull back that opinion and reveal to us very quickly that he hadn't, and his own confess and profession and actions will show that he is rich, and he's not the ruler of his riches. His riches ruled him. And this is the giant fear with wealth in the world today. And remember, well, if we get to it, Jesus is going to talk about it's more difficult for a rich man to enter heaven than it is to squeeze a camel through the eye of a needle. Remember, in America, you are the rich person. We are so wealthy. Our wealth here exceeds people's wildest dreams and uh, in, in other countries. And so this is written to us. Our pastime in America is covetousness. How many of us have the catalogs that you just sit and look at catalogs of items? Sharper Image is just a, a, a catalog of, of covetousness. Wow, maybe I should get that for myself because it's really cool. You know, now there's uh, how cool is that or dude, I want that websites where they have the coolest, most amazing stuff out there. You're like, wow, 12 grand. That's really cool. Maybe someday because everyone needs a diamond studded envelope opener or whatever it may be. So anyways, we are so wealthy today. They are finding ways to upgrade. I mean, <laughs> gold pistols. Yeah, they're really pretty. Things like that. You know, you just see people flashing the bling because they can, and it's promoted and pushed on the young people left and right and all the music videos and all this stuff, all the gangsta living. They can't afford to feed their babies, but they got all this gold chain going on and their gold nines and whatever. It's just, it's ridiculous. Anyways, Jesus will get to the heart of the matter with this young man because he says, now do something super duper difficult. Love your neighbor as yourself. The golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The young man, blind to his own covetousness, blind to his own selfishness, says, all these things I've kept from my youth, what do I still lack? You know, I, I, Jesus must have chuckled inside. He's like, <laughs> he 
stepped right into it. And, and of course, you know, he's God, and, and he loves this person, and he wants to, to see him saved. And so I, I say tongue-in-cheek that he chuckled inside, but Jesus, knowing the outcome, you know, we don't know if this man ever became one of the disciples. Some would like to say, oh, this would be Joseph of Arimathea or whatever. We have no idea. We can always hope so. What do I still lack? James, 2.20 is what you lack. Do you want to know, oh, foolish man, faith without works is dead? Okay. His, his faith in his own goodness is what was showing forth. But he had no works of faith where he was willing to say, I can surrender my well-being, my comfort, and my cared forness to the Lord. I can surrender my wealth to the Lord in this situation and see God is going to provide and take care of me. So Jesus says to him in verse 21, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be mature in this, if you want to come to completion, you're wanting to come into eternal life, if you want to come into that to be perfect in your goal of eternal life, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. So again, uh, we've seen it taking up your cross daily, uh, becoming as a little child, and now he's saying to give up your self-reliance, your self-worth, the things that you treasure and hold on to, and this is part of taking up your cross. This is the call to discipleship. Now, he's not saying to everyone who ever reads this, sell all that you have and follow me. There have been so many people who have been wonderful. They've got that Midas touch, and every time they make more than they need, they give it away. Okay, God has raised up some people. <laughs> I have to laugh at myself. I, I'm, I don't have that. I'll be like, I think I can buy that, fix it up, and sell it, and make a little... Eh. Pretty rare when I actually do that. It rusts and rots away before I get around to it. I just don't have the Midas touch. I don't make those decisions. Well, this is a call for some people. This is the difficult call of following Jesus, of becoming a disciple. This is the burden. This is the difficult cross they have to pick up and say, Lord, I have a lot of money. I've earned it. And you know, you know the people. I am smarter than everyone else. And that's what I think is kind of funny. I just a little, a little personal venting here. When people think that they're better than everyone else because they are able to make more money. Some people are better at asking for money. Some people are just, they're, they're good at it. You know, it's hard to go to your employer and say, I'm worth more when, they, when you already know what the budget is and what have you. But there's some people who they just take it on themselves and they say, I am so good at making money. I would almost bet that the billionaires that happened over the past two years of COVID lockdown, they didn't make their money doing philanthropic things. They didn't actually help a lot of people. There's always some out there. Don't, don't, don't send me letters saying there's this guy. Actually, do. I, I'd love to know about it. But most of the time, it's done out of selfishness. And so often, people think that they are so awesome, and that's why they are so wealthy. And so, Jesus tells him to sell it, to give it away, and then you'll have reward in heaven and follow me. So this is this man's particular call to discipleship. And then Matthew tells us, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So he believed he owned these possessions, he controlled these possessions, but of course the possessions are controlling him. And that's the difficult place in each of our life. When our finances are controlling us, then we are serving mammon and not God. There's lots of different calls for believers to be very, very careful about money and to not allow the deceitfulness of riches. Let me read to you a few of them. Matthew 13, 22, in Jesus' parable of the four soils, one of the people receives the soil and they sprout up quickly. He says, now, now he who received the seed among the thorns is he who heard the word and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and they become unfruitful. Riches can be very deceitful and keep us from being effective in God's economy, in God's work. Mark 10, 23, same parable. Or is this the same parable? Nope, this is the same account with a rich young ruler, but I like how Jesus says it here. 
Then, this is Mark 10, 23, then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again, and he said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. We can see a very strong contrast between those who are full of faith and those who are full of riches and trusting in riches, entering into the kingdom of God or missing it by, by money, you know. We don't want to do that. Let's see. I'll save those verses for later. So, this young, rich young ruler shows his hand. He said, I have kept those commands from my youth, but he hadn't taken his money and given it to the poor, right? And so he wasn't loving his neighbor as his self. He wasn't putting his money where his mouth is, literally. He'd said, I've kept these commandments. And so Jesus says, no, no, you need to understand, give away your money and give it to the poor. Do to those, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I wouldn't doubt that in that man's relationship personally, his neighbor said that day, hey, rich young guy, can you spare a few shekels? We don't know, but we all know how it is. You don't deserve my money. I work hard. You don't, however we judge that. We need to just have a sensitive heart to the Lord about finances. We need to make sure that we are not um, those who are turned away by the Lord because we, we miss out. Matthew 16, 26, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet loses his own soul? We can have so much in this world and miss out on all of God's goodness. And it's, it's an epidemic in the church today. I've watched some documentaries over the years uh, that were trying to bring people uh, to understanding about the health, wealth, and prosperity false gospel when people say that uh, money is, is the big deal. Jesus said in, in Mark 16 there how um, he had to say it again, those who trusted in certain riches, it's, it's hard for them to get saved. He'll say it again in Matthew uh, 25 here, the disciples, wow, who then can be saved? We'll get there in a second. It, and it's happened quite a bit in our world today. Again, at that time in Jesus' time, the rabbis taught that if you were a good Jew, God would make you successful and financially well off. Okay? God would bless you financially. God would bless you physically. And those things are lies. I, I just always like to mention Johnny Erickson Tata. She is probably the most heartfelt believer, the things I've heard her say about her suffering in her life and how through that suffering, that is how God has continually revealed her himself to her. As I've said in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that we move from, we are being transformed into his image from glory to glory. That transformation only happens when our flesh is crucified. Our flesh is not crucified when we're rolling in, in the dough like Scrooge McDuck. That is not an opportunity for God to show us our need for him. And so we have to make sure that we are not like the church in Revelation 3.17, the church of Laodicea. I, I, I feel bad for myself. I still want to talk about Philadelphia and Laodicea because on Wednesday night, that's where we're going and we're going to do movie night instead. Please join us. Anyways, Revelation 3.17, Jesus says to this church in Laodicea, you say, I am rich. I have need of nothing. I've become wealthy. But you do not know that you were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And I'm afraid that is the state of the church in America. We have need of nothing, and we have forgotten that we need God. Well, let's pick up in verse 23. We'll try to make it to the end of the chapter and do communion also. Verse 23, then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, assuredly, I say to you, that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, we all have to just stop and take heed to this word. He says it assuredly, and I said, we're Americans, so we are all rich people. Compared to the majority of the world, 
we need to really be careful about our relationship with God, our relationship with the things we own, possess, or covet after, and make sure that those items are not putting up a wall between us and God. And God is saying, turn to me, repent, stop trusting in your riches. Like I say, the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel is the face of Christianity around the world. Okay? The television stations that are promoting that on a regular basis, they forget about the poor Christians who have nothing to eat. They're on the run. They're persecuted by their government, and all they have is what God daily provides for them. And I guarantee you, God daily provides for them because he promises to do that. So we need to be very, very careful that we're not taken up with taking an old um, satanic method called the secret and saying, since Jesus spoke things into reality, and I'm a Christian, I'm a little Christ, I can speak positive words into my reality. Hey, be positive. Absolutely. Be the most positive person around. Do that. But don't think that you speaking positive words of, that's for me, or putting a poster on your wall of the vehicle you want, that that is going to bring about in you a manifestation of the creation of the Word of God, bringing about material riches for you. Come on. Be a Christian. Don't be a pagan. That, that is an ancient method. It is called the secret, the, 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 the secret of positive confession. And they've taken that and they've put it into Christianity. And they say, so if you confess and Jesus spoke and it was created, you can speak and it'll be created too. It's not how it works out. For the, the grace of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you may become rich. Christianity is about an exchange. It's about a change of life through us giving, not receiving. What did Jesus say? It's more blessed to give than to receive. So Jesus says it is so hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 24 of Matthew 19. Again, I say to you, okay, he's reiterating, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God because people don't like that. A myth came about. Well, you see, back on the back side of the wall in Jerusalem there where the Temple Mount was, there, there, was, a, there was a gate, and it was called the eye of the needle. And the eye of the needle was a gate that was made that the camel could get through it only when he humbled himself and got on all four and had to crawl through the gate. And if you are humble, you can have your riches. No, that's made up. Archaeologists have been there. They've dug around. There's no gate called the eye of a needle. The Greek here is a sewing needle. This is a small needle. The only way you get a camel through the eye of a needle is to grind it up in the hamburger. Nobody wants to eat ground hamburger. I mean, ground camel. Anyways, it's just not very useful when it gets to the other side. When his disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? And so, like I say, in Jesus' day, the rabbis taught that if you, were, if you were good, like this rich young ruler, he was probably looking for praises from Jesus. You're so rich, you must be good. The disciples were even caught up in it. Who then can be saved? And of course, we know that we are saved by grace through faith, by our confession of faith in Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus that was shed on our behalf, God imputing Jesus' righteousness to us as our sins were imputed into Jesus Christ while he was on that cross. We know we're saved in that manner. The disciples weren't quite getting yet, but Jesus looked at them. I wonder how long he looked at them. Like, I mean, he said, how long shall I be with you? Have you not read... So he probably gave them a look. Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible, okay? The rich young ruler couldn't do anything to save himself. Jesus' words were showing that he had not kept the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself because his neighbor was in need and he had the need that could have cured the neighbor's problem. And he was not willing to do so. He went away sadly because his riches had control over him. So with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. 
than Peter. He says something good here. It wasn't uh, putting his foot in his mouth. Peter answered and said to him, See, and he points to the 12 I'm imagining, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Peter, he'd left his fishing business, Mark chapter 4, oh, Matthew chapter 4. Jesus says to Peter, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And Peter dropped his nets and just followed after the Lord. And he's like, Lord, I'm worried about my finances. I had a lucrative business. What will we receive? So Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you, that in the regeneration, uh, this is an interesting word, Genesis. Uh, I don't like I say, I don't speak Greek. Let me see if I can get the pronunciation of it there again. Anyways, a, a, interesting word. We'll talk about it. Uh, we'll talk about this subject in Revelation uh, in two weeks because I think it just fits better there uh, for where we're going. Palingenesia. So it's the word Genesis and palin. Um, it's a, a, a new beginning, right? In the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes. I think that's just fantastic. I just want to have, make sure you have a, a note in your Bible uh, for that. The other time that, uh, that uh, re- regeneration word is used is in Titus chapter 3. Verse 5, I'll just read it to you just because it's great um, for your studies. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So washed through that regeneration, we are sanctified by the cleansing of the water of the word. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind through the word of God. This is all fitting together in that same thing. So he says to Peter, Peter, when this whole thing is over and I create a, a new earth, the millennial reign, assuredly I say to you, in that regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on his throne in glory, you who have followed me will sit on 12 thrones. Remember, there's 12 apostles. The apostle, the age apostles is done. Uh, there aren't modern day apostles of Jesus you want to get technical, if you're sent by the Holy Spirit as an evangelist or a missionary, you know, I guess you could say you're a sent one, a small a apostle, but the 12 apostles are the 12 thrones. We'll read about that in Revelation 22, the 12 foundations of the heavenly city, and they will judge the 12 tribes of Israel. That, there's just so much really cool stuff there that is manifested in the book of Revelation or brought to light fully in the book of Revelation. We'll hit that later, but just make sure your Bible's marked up there. Think about studying Monday morning when you read your, read your Bible again. So, anyways, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my... Now, so since wife is in this category, it doesn't mean leaving your wife, but it means going out as Jesus sent his disciples out, as he sent the apostles out to go and preach the word. Remember, Peter had a wife. He didn't divorce her to go and be um, an apostle. But he went and ministered separately from her. Those who are sent out, they will, who leave all those things, wife and children and lands, for my name's sake. Remember, it's not just going in the name of your church mission group or whatever. You know, there's a lot of short-term missions that go, and that's fantastic but it's very rare when missions today, when short-term missions today are in Jesus' namesake, right? They're going, we're going to go to Africa and we're going to dig a well and we're going to make sure this village has water. That's fantastic, but make sure you go in Jesus' namesake. They need to, when you leave, they need to know the gospel. Whether they receive it or reject it, that's not the point. But just digging a well, that's nice, Make sure your mission trip, when you leave home and you're going for the Lord, make sure you bring up Jesus, that you go in his namesake. They shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Now, that's why you're not going to inherit eternal life going on mission trips that, that aren't about evangelism, right? That just means that you're probably not saved yourself. So if you're bringing the gospel, if you're bringing the name of Christ and exalting that, then it's 
Christians do that, right? Other people exalt themselves. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. So that is illustrated with this rich young ruler, that he, even though he wanted to be first, he's last. And then Jesus will uh, give a wonderful parable in chapter 20 about the laborers in the vineyard, those who show up last get the same payment as those who came first. It's a, probably a beautiful picture of the church and his reward for us. But we'll end right there, get ready for communion this morning. So we're living in a time when there are so many evil teachers and deceivers who want to think that godliness is a means of gain, and we want to avoid that. Okay, So there's rewards with riches, God's going to provide for us. If, if you have a lot of money and you're like, Lord, can I buy this? Can I buy that? Can I use these things in my own life? And, and you're not convicted about it. If you feel good about it, then you follow what the Lord says to you and you, you go ahead and do it. But if, if you're asking the Lord, should I buy this? And he says, well, who are you going to share it with? Says, Nobody. I'm going to hide it. It's going to be my own, very own. You know, It's probably not the Lord giving you that peace, you know, if you have to put it on credit cards and such, you know, you really should think about whether or not you should do that. We shouldn't be in debt. We shouldn't be in bondage because um, then we're, we're not able to serve the Lord as, as we would like. So we're living in a time, I think it's just great. I mentioned it in the prayer. I'll read it. First Timothy chapter, excuse me, Second Timothy chapter 3. We're living at a time when there's so much more money being spent on pleasures for yourself. 2 Timothy 3, we have the 17 ailments of the end times, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. There's people who um, don't believe in, in the last days, preterists, they don't think that, uh, they, they believe that the church is going to continue to make the world better and better until the earth is saved, essentially, so Jesus can come back. And they would read this verse and say, even in Jesus's day, all of these things existed, but I have to admit and say from my own experience and observation that in the last two years, again, these ailments have magnified themselves exponentially uh, in the world. It is, it is just, wow, it wasn't the advent of, of the virus. It was the advent of TikTok. Hmm. Men will be lovers of themselves. Even the church teaches that today. The Bible says to love others as yourself. So you can't love others until you love yourself. We're, we're to deny ourselves. And men will be perfecting the desires of loving themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. You know, we, we can just so see that. People are just so brutal. Watching uh, the fascists who call themselves anti-fascists and just watching footage of them that they would turn on each other because I believe so many of them are demonically inspired that they'll just turn on each other like rabid dogs in a group. As they're feeding on one carcass, they'll beat down and, and, and feed on another. Despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure. pleasure. They're hedonists, hedon, hedonomai, so the Greek there. Um, rather than lovers of God. And it says having a form of godliness. Now, isn't that interesting? They can have a form of godliness. So this is very frightening, that these 17 ailments can be inside of the church, but yet they have no ability to deny themselves. They never take up their cross, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. It's a horrible place to be. Peter tells us in 2 Peter 2.3, I'm, I'm going to go through some of the watch out fors, the scriptures about watch out for these guys. And uh, 2 Peter 2.3, by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. God's going to get them. He's going to take care of it. But by covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. 1 Timothy 6.5 they have useless wranglings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. 
<laughs> For such withdraw yourself. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. We'll probably turn back uh, to First Timothy 6 here. But in the call for us, we are to be, let's turn to Hebrews 11, 25 and 26. This is just a great passage. You should have it underlined in your Bible. We're called to something so much more, something greater. In Colossians 3, 5, as you're turning to Hebrews eleven twenty five, 25, Colossians 3, 5 tells us covetousness is idolatry, right? When we are coveting, it's idolatry. And behind every idol is a demon. Do you think that maybe, since we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in heavenly places, that the demons who are assigned to your life know your taste. They know the things that you like and the things that you're after. And they can just speak into your mind, you really need that. Because in today's world, it's not only the wealthy, the, the, the lie that if you're uh, blessed, you're going to be wealthy and that wealth, uh, that a good life will make you blessed. It's also the lie of status. Now, it's interesting. I am an observer of people, and maybe not everyone is observant as I am, right, in like to a fault on my side, but I watch. I get into crowds, and people know who I am, you know. They avoid making eye contact with me. I'll mention something about some sort of Christian event or things like that, and they, they avoid here. They avoid here. Because one, we preach the gospel. Christians, it would seem. But two, because, well, who are the affluent people in your congregation? I'd say you're the richest people in this valley. But those who are known with a great name, who if you name drop, they go, oh, ooh, I would like to sit next to them in a pew also because I would like to borrow some money. I would like to get some financial advice. I want to get free lawyering. I want, I want the guy with the backhoe and the, and the dump truck. Whatever. It's interesting how because this congregation isn't overflowing with affluence, people avoid this congregation. I don't know why. I, that's just such a weirdest thing. But being in the business world for years, too, I knew people who they would go, hey, where do you go to church? Is it, is it a wealthy church? And if I'd say yes, well, I'll come visit. <laughs> because there's, there's leads there. They'd show up not with, not with note cards and Bible verses. They'd show up with business cards to hand out to others. The finality of our life is what did we learn about Jesus and what did we do with it? Hebrews 11 25. I'm not there yet. There you go. C. That's chapter 12. That didn't make sense at all. There we go. Verse 24. Sorry. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Egypt, of course, is the world. And he looked for the reward. There's reproach in following Jesus Christ. But when we see the reproach of Christ a greater rich than everything that this world can offer us, we're free. We're free to give we're free to live by faith. We're free to just let the Lord speak into our heart. And when he says, I, I want you to sell that and give the money to Jason. I'm kidding. I want you to sell that and find a way to invest in the kingdom with that money, the care net, whatever it may be. That you can say, God, I, I trust in you. And I'm willing to enjoy the pleasures of the kingdom of heaven I guess I should just end with this one. We'll take communion. There's a lot more passages and a lot more warnings. I, I, 
read James chapter 5. It's an end times verse, and it's an exhortation against the wealthy who are uh, holding back wages to the poor. Their gold is corrupted and corroded. I, I think it's just got to be applicable to the billionaires and the multimillionaires of our day who are uh, using the money for drugs and pharmacia because it's, it's the, <laughs> those who are laboring in the field who are crying out. And the Lord says, I hear their cries. And the Lord of warfare, the Lord of Seboath is at the door. Okay, that's just a, an interesting thing. James chapter 5, you can look at that on your own. But James 5 too, your riches are corroded and your garments are moth-eaten. Right? We, we need to store up our treasures in heaven, not here on this earth. 1 Timothy 6, 17, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches. Does that speak to us today? If you had $100,000 in the bank in 2018, you have $60,000 in the bank today in the same buying power. They are deflating the dollar. It's not inflation. It's the deflation of the value of the dollar. It's just crazy. It's intentional. We're going to, they're going to try to bankrupt the world so they can implement a new world order. It's great. The Bible tells us all about it. We should rejoice. But they are uncertain riches. But in the living, but in the, oh yeah, nor, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us all richly things to enjoy. So this morning, we could carry on, but we'll take communion instead. Oh, these are those. You got to peel one layer to get that out and then peel the next layer. I would recommend getting prepared ahead of time <laughs> this morning. In the air, are you sanctified? Does the Lord control your bank account and your wallet and your spending? Or does the enemy of our souls? Just think about that. Through covetousness, Satan can convince you to forfeit eternal reward. Satan can convince you to hold tightly to your wad of green. He can convince you to serve mammon instead of God. Because of covetousness, he can convince you to essentially close the door of heaven to those who are lost because you need that extra money for that double macchiato latte every day, whatever it may be. Simple things that aren't good for you anyways. <laughs> I won't get on that bandwagon. But simple things that God would say, can you sacrifice a little bit so that your sacrifice allows my sacrifice to be made available to the lost? Is Satan able to, through that idol of your covetousness, to shut down the kingdom of God, to shut down evangelism, to shut down your boldness in saying in, in mixed company something about Jesus because you're afraid of losing status, because you're afraid of losing your job, just imagine, just imagine, if you lost your job in this life, sharing in the gospel, and then God provides for you, whatever happens, and then on that day in heaven, someone walks up to you and says, you said this in the break room. I turned you into the union, but then later on, the Lord turned me into a Christian. We don't know, but we do know that if we don't share, the gospel doesn't go forth. If we don't share out of our own excess, it slows down the gospel. So you have a communion song. Let me pray. And then I just want us to take time during that song and then we'll take communion together. Father, I pray, Lord, God, that we would be sanctified in our finances. God, this is hard. This is personal. But Lord, allowing our, our bank account, allowing 
our, our wallet, Lord, to be available and open to you, God, in these last days. How much riches do we need to make it to the finish line? We don't know. So, God, you're asking us in our personal relationship to pursue you and to pursue your heart, Lord, to open up our riches and give them to you that you can use them for the kingdom. Father, only you know. I can't speak to anyone here, but you can. So, Father, today as we just take this time to be surrendered in your presence, Lord, God, one of the greatest sins in the, of the church in America is covetousness, is greed, is saying we are rich and we have need of nothing. Oh God, may we be clothed in your righteousness, not found naked. May we see through your word and your Holy Spirit, not being blind. So Lord, we pray, God, that your spirit would just move here today. God, that you would just convict our hearts, Lord, of the places we have gone astray and we are holding on to sin and covetousness and idolatry in the possessions that control us. We pray, God, that you would help us. We pray, Lord, that we wouldn't be like this rich young ruler who went away from you useless instead of useful. We pray, God, that we would have hearts to hear what, you, hear what you are saying to us in the realm of our finances, and that we could glorify you. In Jesus' name. Lord, our desire is to be useful to you. And it's, it's a difficult thing in the realm of being sanctified in our wallet. It's hard. It's a, a long struggle, struggle. Some people have the gift of giving. Some people can just give, and that's, that's great, but most of us are gifting maybe somewhere else, and so just trusting God with finances is difficult and it's hard. And I'm not saying all this because I, I want to see our offering plate fuller than ever today. God has places for you to give. He has people for you to give to. And we're fine here. I pray you just would have ears to hear how God is leading you. But God wants us to be sanctified and useful for every good work. 2 Timothy 2, I'll read a little passage of scripture here before we take communion. But just in the realm of this rich young ruler walking away saddened, he was not useful to Jesus in any way. He didn't become a disciple. His finances controlled him, and he was not saved. He was not sanctified at that time. 2 Timothy 2.14, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Be diligent to study. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a worker that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their message will spread like cancer. Hymenius and Alexander, excuse me, Hymenius and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection has already passed, and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So we have to pause there today before we take communion. I know we're on the subject of, of finances and faith, but God would have you to depart from all iniquity today. This is one of the opportunities that we have with the communion table to just say, God, I've been struggling with fear. I've been struggling with anxiety. I've been struggling with, with lust or covetousness, and I have... I've got some things in my life I just need to lay down. Now, I, I promise you that if you confess them today, 
if you renounce them in the name of Jesus and you come to the table with a clean conscience before God, he will strengthen you for tomorrow and you will be able to walk sanctified before the Lord. He can do that and he does that. He changes hearts, he changes minds, he changes our walks, but he wants us to confess it with an earnest heart, with a heart full of faith that Jesus alone is your savior of your soul and can save you from the iniquity that is racking you today. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some of honor and some of dishonor. In God's house, there's people of honor and people of dishonor. There's going to be some people who will get to heaven and they will be saved as through fire. And their reward is salvation, but there are others who are like vessels of gold and silver. They've sanctified themselves. They've purified their lives for the Lord, and their inheritance is salvation plus God's reward for faithfulness. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the ladder of the wooden stubble, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful to the master, prepared for every good work. If we can sanctify our wallet, we are useful to Jesus, and then we are prepared for every good work. You know that when you're not sanctified, when you're not walking with the Lord, you're not, you're not prepared to work for Him. You know that you struggle. You know that things aren't right. You know that God's not happy with that situation. So today, before we take this communion, just want to give us a moment to make sure that whatever the Lord has laid on your heart today, you've said, yes, Lord. If he's laid something on your heart about your own iniquity, about your own sin, about your own hidden fears, know that God is greater than your fears. He's greater than your heart, and he has for you sanctification and freedom today because you confess we don't need to go on our knees and crawl to Jesus and, and earn our salvation. We don't need to earn his favor. We confess before the Lord. He, he is faithful and just. He will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God has for us healing. God has for us his healing, his son, his fullness. In the night that Jesus was betrayed, betrayed he took bread. He says, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. We thank you, Lord, for the body that was broken for us. God, that the only cure you saw fit, the only thing that was feasible to save us from our sins even though we, like the rich young ruler, so often think of ourselves as good and want to prove that. The only cure for the sin of humanity was the very crucifixion, the very death, the very punishment of God's own son, punished by his own father on that cross. That Jesus became the exchange for our sins. That he not only paid the penalty for our sins, he bore them in our own body, but the regret and, and, and the fear and the repercussions of sin, he has dealt with so much so that we can be free in Jesus. Second, 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his own body on that tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. For we were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. We just thank you, Lord, for this gift, Lord, that your body was broken for us. God, help us not to take this in vain, but Lord, you suffered and died in our place that we, through your resurrection from the dead, we have eternal life. Romans 8, 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in us. We just thank you, Lord, that you went to the cross. You suffered and you died for us. In the same manner, Jesus took the cup. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant. The old has passed away. 
the law could not save us because we were sold out to sin. But Jesus came and he condemned sin in his own flesh. He lived perfectly. He created a new covenant in his own blood. And that blood washes us. That blood cleanses us. That blood, blood sanctifies us. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all our sins. He said, this is the covenant in my blood, which is broken for you. And he tells us that every time we take this bread, drink this cup, that we commemorate the Lord's death until he comes. So Lord, I pray that we just not, did not do any of this in vain today, Lord, that we were able to confess before you, that we were able to come before you openly and freely and say, Lord, I want I want you to be my bookkeeper. I want to be useful for every good work and sanctified. Be a vessel that is cleansed by the Lord because we've been cleansed by your blood. Help us, Lord, to live in the fullness of what you've done for us. We just pray your blessing on us. Let's take the cup together. We just thank you, Lord, for the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord, for this gift of salvation. We thank you, Lord, for the ongoing gift of sanctification for your saints. Lord, I do pray, God, that as we are entering into an age, a period of time when there may be great financial struggles, God, that we would be able to open up our wallets Lord, knowing that you will provide for us and we open our wallets and help those who are in need, God, and, and open the door for the gospel. We pray, God, you would just use us in these days not to be fearful, not to be hoarding, but, God, to be gracious in giving. I pray, Lord, that we would be able to glorify your son, Jesus. God, that he would glorify himself in his churches. And, Lord, we just pray that our hearts would be surrendered to you, and we'd see your provision and your care in these days, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you can make it out Wednesday.